Certainly it is a blessing to be in the house of God on tonight. Somebody said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I thought about that in the scripture. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go in. Not that I was in already, but that, that I had the opportunity to go. See, it's a blessing to be a saint, to be able to get out to the house of God, just to hear God's word. It's a, it's a blessing. I love the fact that, that God cares so much for me. He gives me a place to come and worship and to learn and hear about him. It's truly a blessing. Um, tonight, I want to talk about the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. So if we could go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 7, we'll read. I guess I'll read. You can read if you like. I wasn't feeling too good earlier. I was like, man, you know, sometimes you just, you ain't feeling it. Kind of got the sniffles a little bit, but you ain't, you know, you ain't sick, sick, but you know, you ain't feeling as you ought to be. So please pray for, uh, pray for me in a very special way. Nonetheless, God's got a word for us on the night. I, well, I know he's got a word for me. So I, I come looking for something too. The, the teacher wants something too. The Holy Ghost going to teach me. So in Matthew chapter 5, 1 through 7, it says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Um, this is, is what we would deem the Sermon on the Mount or part of what the Sermon on the Mount is. And I want you to notice in verse 1 what he says. It's, it, it says that when Jesus went up into the mountain and he was set down, his disciples came unto him. Now, there was a multitude there too, but this was strictly for just his disciples. In one place uh, in Matthew, it says, And his disciples came unto him and said, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. So this was not for everybody. In other words, this ain't for everybody. This is what he's given them when he opened up his mouth and he spake. In verse 2, it says, and he opened up his mouth and he taught them. He did not teach the multitude. He taught his disciples. So, in other words, the Sermon on the Mount is not for everybody. It's for God's people. It's for his church. When they were to get saved on the day of Pentecost, then they were to fulfill the law that he gave them. It was not, it's not for the world. See, the world, you got to get in the church first. And then once you get into to the church, then you can try to keep up, keep up with the church. But you, you can't keep, don't try to do the laws. You got, you got to crawl before you can walk. Amen. So in, in Matthew, he's given us, like I said, what is the Beatitudes? And I want you to think of the Beatitudes as a staircase. They're, they're stairs. They're progressive steps. So if we're talking about mercy and blessed are the merciful, well, the first step, is poor in spirit. So I cannot jump to from, from poor in spirit straight to merciful. I have to go from blessed are the poor in spirit to those that mourn. Because it's just like school. In school, nobody starts in 12th grade. You don't just, <laughs> I don't know, kid. You, you know, nowadays you got kid genius, baby genius, but I, I don't know nobody that start in, starts in first grade and skips to second, third, fourth and then jump straight to fifth grade. No, it doesn't work like that, because what I need in second, third, fourth grade is going to prepare me for the fifth grade. I, I need to, to make progression. There has to be steps that have to be made. So before I can get to be merciful, I have to be poor in spirit. Well, what is, what is poor in spirit? Poor in spirit is, is when I heard the gospel preached. When the gospel is preached unto me, there's a condition that is formed in my heart. I see myself as helpless. I see myself as poor, absolutely nothing without God. And because of my condition, because I see myself as nothing without God, the second step is blessed are they that mourn. 
So because of my poor condition, I cry out to God. And when I cry out to God, it says, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. What is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is the comforter. So now I've cried out because of my condition. I have mourned, so God has given me the comforter. Now, blessed are the meek. Now that I have the Holy Ghost, I have the wherewithal to understand the scriptures. See, meek is the teachable. Now I can be taught because I've cried out and God has filled me with his spirit. Now I can be taught a little bit. And so now because I can be taught, there is a hunger that starts to rise up in me because now I have the mind and I have the spirit of God that's searching the deep things, that's searching all things. Now I hunger and thirst for righteousness. And now that I have hungered and thirst for righteousness, I can now give God a return on his investment, which is some fruit. And that first fruit is mercy. See, the first thing I want you to notice about mercy that he says, blessed are the mercy, the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy, to have mercy is a blessed condition. What does it mean to be blessed? To be blessed means to be well off. Well, I, I'm, because a lot of people would tell you to, have mer- to, to show mercy is a sign of weakness. You, you see the movies where they say, finish them. Don't, don't, don't show any signs of weakness. But no, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that, that the discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. So what does that mean? That means it's an honor of mine when somebody does me wrong to forgive them. Say, brother... Wicker, I was coming to church and, you know, it, it was slick outside and I s- slammed into the Camaro and totaled it. I said, brother, you totaled it? <laughs> Man, you ain't, just, you ain't just run into it. You told it? I, might, I, might, I, I shouldn't respond like, I hope you know how. I know how to what? I hope you know how to fight because I'm about to kill you. I, I hope you're saved because you, you're finna meet your maker. No, it, that, that shouldn't be my response. My response should be, brother, you know, I got full coverage. Now, I'm not telling you I'm happy about you totaling my car. I ain't going to lie to you. But my response shouldn't be I'm ready to choke you. I shouldn't be ready to jump on you. I should be ready to show mercy. I should be ready to forgive whatever you've done unto me. Now, now I'm, I'm using that jokingly. But if my brother sins against me, if my brother actually transgresses against me, he has sinned against God. And so because he sinned against God, it is a glory of mine or it's an honor of mine to forgive him because I want my brother to be right with God. I'll prove it to you. Go to Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15. He said, it's his will that nobody perish. Nobody. That's my enemy. It's the one that's persecuting me. It's the one plotting against me. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. He says, moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. See, now the whole point of me going to my brother is so that I can gain him. Because there has been a separation. What's the separation that's taken place? The sin. The sin has caused the separation between me and my brother. So when I go to him, I go to him in love. I don't go to him, you didn't... Boy, no, I, I, I go to him with, with respect. I go to him because the whole, my whole sole purpose is to reconcile what my brother, the, the damage that my brother has caused me. And if my brother has, has, has transgressed against me, then I want him to be right with God. And let me give you an example. If my brother, st- if he steals $10 from me, right, I, I, I go to my brother, brother, you stole $10. Can I please have my $10 back? Now, if he gives me my 10, you know what? I'm sorry, Brother Wicker, I stole you $10. Here go your $10 back. Amen. I, I've gained my brother. I, I address the issue. See, when, when, I, when forgiveness, when I, when I have to give somebody forgive, or when I want forgiveness for somebody, if somebody has sinned against me, I go to them. Now it's up to them if they are going to fulfill the requirements of forgiveness. The, the, the Bible says that God stands ready to forgive. But that's not just... It, th- th- those are conditions. There, it's re- you got to repent. There's conditions to getting the, the forgiveness that God is so readily ready to give you. God wants us and everybody in here that has the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we had to fill those requirements. So when I, when I come to my brother and I address my brother with the situation, hey, I seen you steal $10 out my, uh, out my wallet. Can I have it back? Now, if he don't hear me, what am I supposed to do? 
Verse 16 in Matthew says, but if he will, if he will not hear thee, then take with you one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Now I go get two, two or three uh, witnesses in the church. Now I don't go get my friends. I don't go get, you know, because we, we real close to some people in the church. We real close to some people in the church that if I go to them, they probably going to lean my way. I, I don't I don't go to them. I go to some people that's that's got some discernment. Some people that, that know a little bit about the scriptures, somebody that's going to be impartial. Now, we should all be impartial, but sometimes because I might love somebody, I might not be impartial like I should be. So what I do is I go to two people and, I, and, I, and, and we address the matter between two people. I might get Brother Jeff. Brother Jeff, I got, might get Brother Jeff and Brother Scotty. And I say, look, I, see, I seen Brother Wicker steal $10 out of my wallet. And they say, Brother Wicker, did you steal? He said, yeah, I stole it. So what? So what I stole you ten dollars. So he, he won't hear Brother Jeff. He won't hear Brother Scotty. So what am I supposed to do? But my, the, I, I want you to keep in mind the whole the, the whole pro- process here. I want to gain my brother. I'm trying to get my brother to see the error of his way. I'm trying to see my brother to acknowledge his sin so that he can get forgiveness. I'm trying. I want him to get the forgiveness. I've addressed him with the issue. But now he has to do what it takes to get the forgiveness that I want to give him. I want to give it to him. It's basically his, but he's got to, he's got to give it. He's got to, he's got to cough it over. In verse 17, if he won't hear Brother Jeff and Brother Scotty, verse 17 says, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. So I get up on the pulpit, and I, and I pull out my wallet, and I hold it up, and I tell the church that Brother Wicker stole $10 from me. No, that's not what he's saying. This is talking about the church court. This is the pastor, and whoever the pastor might have sit with him in judgment. You might think of the scripture in Hebrews where the Bible says, obey them that have the rule over you, for they watch for your souls. Well, who is the them? The them is those that sit in judgment with the pastor, that, that conduct matters. Now, in this church, our church is a little small. So the pastor probably takes confession by himself. Well, I'm not on the court, so I don't know. But what I'm saying is our, ch- our church is so small, he might not have people that sit in judgment with him. But when you get in a large church like Moses was in the, in the wilderness, he had people sit in judgment with him. And so those are the people that are watching for your souls. God did not build a one man church. So the pastor needs he needs help. He's got to have assistance. He's got to have people to help him in situations. So the problem is I went to my brother and I, I've, I've asked my brother alone. See, this is what I love about God's church. There's order. It started with just me and my brother. It started with me and my brother, and because my brother would not hear me, I went and I got two witnesses. I didn't go get Angela and Genesis. I got people that are, are well established. Somebody said they ain't saved. I know they I got some people that's well established in the scriptures. They, they seen it my way. My brother still will not hear. So I took it to the church court. He still will not hear the church court. If he won't hear the pastor, the scripture says in, in, in verse uh, 17, I'll finish it. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. If he won't hear the pastor, he's got to put him out the church. But I tried to give my brother forgiveness. I tried to show him mercy. Now, let's flip. Let's flip the coin. What if I didn't see my brother steal the ten dollars? But my brother comes up to me. He says, listen, brother, I stole ten dollars out your wallet. And I turn around and I say, you stole $10 or I ain't forgiving you. You dead to me. Now I'm in trouble with God. Now I'm the one in trouble with God because my brother came to me trying to get mercy. Blessed are the merciful for for they shall obtain mercy. So now my brother has acknowledged to me that he stole. Now now my heart's hardened and I don't want to forgive him. Now I'm the one in trouble with God. I'm the one on the hot seat. So in order for me to obtain the mercy that God has given out, I must show mercy. I got, I, I got to forgive them. And that's a hard thing to do. It's hard to forgive people when my feelings have been hurt. Amen. Amen. It, it really is. It's, it's hard when, when, I, when I'm whelped up. And I know the Bible says we fight not against flesh and blood, but I'm telling you right now, I, I, I'm, I'm ready to get you. I'm, I'm ready to get you. And that's a hard thing for us to deal with. It's, it's a really hard thing to deal with. Blessed are they, it says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. What is the blessing? The blessing is that me, myself, can obtain mercy from God. That is what the blessing is. The blessing is I get to obtain that mercy. So what is mercy? 
Because a lot of times we say mercy is, is God not charging me, God not punishing me when it's well in his rights to punish me. Right? Is that mercy? Oh, y'all didn't got quiet on me. It's the, yeah, they didn't got mighty quiet. It's not a trick question. That is. That is mercy. But, but the scripture goes a little bit deeper, too, because it's, mercy is also compassion. Mercy is empathy. It's not pity. And a lot of times we get mixed up with the two. Well, what do you mean by that, minister? Well, pity is me seeing somebody and me feeling sorry for them. Me, me seeing a homeless man and having pity on him, man, I feel bad. He, he going through, he's struggling. Now, I do feel bad for him. But, but what is compassion? Compassion is this, me putting myself in his shoes. And because I put myself in his shoes, I'm showing empathy. What am I going to do? I am moved to do something. I'm moved to, I'm moved to action. I don't just pity the man, but I'm, I'm moved with empathy. I move with compassion to do something about his situation. So what do I do? I see a homeless man. I see it's raining. I see it's cold outside. And my compassion says this. You know what? Hey, I'm going to give you $50. Get your hotel room for the night. That's what compassion says. That's the difference between compassion and pity. Pity doesn't do anything for me. You can keep your pity. Give me some compassion. <laughs> do a little bit for me. The, Bible's, the, the Bible preaches this. It teaches this. Jesus Christ is the compassion. Jesus Christ is the mercy of God extended to the world. He was the compassion that God had because God seen our condition that we were helpless. The Bible says no man could redeem his brother nor could give to God a ransom for him. So he says, so therefore my own arm brought salvation unto me. So because I seen man helpless, because I seen man in a condition where man could not help himself because man could not save himself. I got roped himself in flesh and felt what you feel. He felt what I feel. And so he was moved with compassion and did something about it. Let us go to, I'll expound on that. Let us go to Hebrews chapter 4. I think mercy is a beautiful thing because if you really think about what God has done, this is really what mercy is. Mercy is compassion. It's, it's, it's being, it's putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and feeling the pain that they feel. This is what God had to do for us. In Hebrews 4, 15, I didn't even give you the verse. Y'all supposed to be spiritual. Verse, verse 15. In Hebrews 4, 15, it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So in order for God to be touched with the feelings of my infirmity, he had to have a body because God is a spirit. And so for God to feel what I felt as a man, for God to, to know what it's like to, to, to cry, for God to know what it's like to hunger, for God to know what it's like uh, to, to lose a loved one, to be tempted in all points, to be tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust, to lust of the, uh, the eye, the pride of life. The, the Bible says that the spirit maketh inter intercession for us. That God helps our infirmities. God walked in this flesh. He's seen that we could not help ourselves. He's seen that we were destitute. So what he, what he was, he was touched with everything that I was touched with. And so being, being touched with, I was touched with seeing that I could not save myself. He died for me. He died for me and sent back the Holy Ghost so that I can make it over. This is what God done to us. God, went, God has went to great lengths for us to be saved. This is what the mercy of God says. The mercy of God says, I'm not just going to pity you. I know that you were born in sin. I know that you fell, but I'm going to do something about your situation. So I'm going to come and I'm going to give you the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and I'm going I'm to allow you to walk upright. I'm going to allow you to talk right. I'm going to allow you to walk like you're supposed to walk. I'm going to allow you to be like me. See, a lot of people don't understand that God, he did not take on the nature of angels. The Bible says he took on the nature of Adam, of the sons of man. Why do you think it is that, that angels cannot be redeemed? God's not concerned about the angels. He took on flesh. He took on flesh for me. He took on flesh for you so I can feel what my people feel. So I can be touched like they are touched. I really want to hit on that because I want you to see the length that God went through just so he could have mercy. Just so he could have mercy on me. Right? Let me read what, what, what Isaiah says. Isaiah says in one place, he says, he was despised and rejected of man. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And we hid 
as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and he was esteemed and, uh, and we esteemed him not. He says in another place, and he was made and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. It pleased God to punish that body. It pleased God that all the sins of the world was poured out on that body. That pleased God. God did not just do that for no reason. He did that for me. He did that for for you. That had a purpose. It says Jesus being the author and finisher, finisher of our faith for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. The scripture says despising the shame. What does that mean? That means he thought little to be mocked. He thought, man, that ain't nothing for my people. I'll be spit upon. I'll be bruised. I'll be kicked. I'll be, I'll be smitten. You know how, you know how, how bad it feels when you're, when you're truly lied upon and you ain't did nothing wrong. Y'all know I'm talking good when, when, when you know you did nothing wrong and yet they bring accusations against you. How bad does that make you feel when you've been doing all that you're supposed to do? When you've been living the life that you're supposed to before God and the enemy comes and, 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 he, and they lying on you. And the enemy comes and they're persecuting you. And the enemy comes and, 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 and they're uh, burdening you down. Jesus felt all that when all the sins of the world was dumped on him. But he thought it nothing. The, the, the scripture says, the plowers have plowed upon my back. They made long their furrows. That's one of my favorite scripture because it gives you a, a great depiction. When the, when, the, when, the, when the ground is ready to be, uh, when the farmer, before he, I don't know what the big, what's that big machine called? I know I got a farmer in the house. He said a tractor. That simplifies it. it it's a tractor, but it's, it's a specific name. But it's a tractor. It's what? The big combine. Amen, the big combine. And he takes that in those big, those big dips. It, I, I like to think of a, a wave. You ever been in a wave pool and you, and you see the big, that's what, that's what our Lord and Savior back look like. So that he could so that he could save me so, so that that he could take my my place in death so that I could take his place in life. That, that, that is so beautiful to me because that was my death. I was supposed to die that death. That was for me. But because he's seen that I could not save myself, I'm going to help them. I'm going to do something about it. And, and, and I just think that's 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 beautiful. Find my space here. So what am I supposed to do? This should prompt me to do something. When I see sinners in the world, when I see people that do not have the Holy Ghost, what should I be moved with? I should be moved with the same compassion. Why? Because me, myself, was was a sinner. Me, myself, walked those same shoes. Me, myself, was influenced by the fallen nature. Me, myself, swore. Me, myself, kicked people. Me, myself, fought people. Me, myself, persecuted people. Me, myself, was w- without hope. Me, myself, w- was influenced by demons, by, by the fallen nature. We don't fight against flesh and blood. That's what I was and somebody else, and God had compassion on me. I, I thought about this the other day. I thought about how God died for his enemies. It wasn't that he just, it wasn't that I was automatically in the church. I was an enemy of God, and he died for me. So when I see others that do not have God, that don't have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I should be moved with compassion because before God saved me, that's who I was. I shouldn't beat so bad. I shouldn't be. We shouldn't beat them up so bad because that's who you used to be. That's who I was before God saved me. So that that should stir something up in me. Lord, I'm going to have mercy on them. I know they're doing me wrong, but I remember what I did to you. If, if, If God was to mark iniquity, who could stand? Where would I be at if God did not show, extend that same kind of mercy unto me? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. That, that, is, what I, that is my desire, because I, I want the mercy of God. I have fallen short. And so because I have fallen short, I, I want that same, extent, that same lifeline. See, we expect too much from people that ain't saved. I feel like a lot of times we, 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 we expect them to just want to do right and because, because that's how we are. Because God has saved us, so sometimes we, we bias to right. We, we are. We're biased to right, and we think everybody should just do right like doing right comes natural. But no, it, my, nature is not, my nature is not designed to do right. 
That's why I love the Holy Ghost so much because it gives me that power. It gives me that ability to say, you know what? Even though my flesh wants to do wrong, I, not today. You're not going to do it today. Now, tomorrow, don't worry about tomorrow. Today, you're not going to do it. And tomorrow's another fight. But that's why I think and praise God for the Holy Ghost because that, that's, what, that's the power that I have. So I should be moved with compassion. I heard, I heard a rapper say this one time. No, I was not listening to rap. It was a video. I'm saved, saints. I, it was a video I was listening, uh, looking at on Facebook. And the rapper said something that was real good to me. He said, trust people to be them. He said, if you know a person is a liar, trust them to lie to you. Because they have proven to you that they, that they lie. If a person is a thief, trust them to steal from you. Don't have your purse next to a thief and, and, and be mad when he steals from you. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that to yourself. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to put myself in, in that kind of situation and then say, God, don't let them steal. No, you knew they stole and you set your purse down there. Right. But if I know somebody steals, trust them to steal because they have shown me already that, that, that they are a thief. So a sin, trust a sinner to sin. Trust a sinner to be who he is because he is not safe. So trust him to be that and don't beat him up for who he is. Ask God to have, have mercy on him. That, that should help us pray for our enemies. Compassion, empathy, mercy. That's who I used to be. I really want to nail that because I, I, I even me myself, sometimes I forget where I used to be at. And God got to tell me that's that's who you used to be. You're not above that. You're not above that without me. If it wasn't for my spirit, that's who you would be. Matter of fact, if it wasn't for my spirit, you'd probably be worse than that. And me knowing me before I got saved, I, I'm telling you, I got everybody beat. We ain't comparing sins, but I, I, I got everybody beat. So th that's what I'm saying. Go, to Matt, go, to Matt, go back to Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. I'll jump over my scripture here. I did. Go back to verse 21. Y'all supposed to be helping me. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Keep me honest. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, this is Peter. It says, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often should my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. So in other words, Peter is asking, how many times should I forgive my brother until I can jump on him? How many times? <laughs> that's, that's what he that's, that's what he's in essence. That's what he's asking. How often should I forgive my brother? Seven. That's why he puts a number on it, because there's a limit to how much we can take. You, you hear people say it all the time. You got one more time. <laughs> I, tell, I tell my kid, I'm telling you right now, y'all better give me some peace. Y'all got one more time to disturb me and it's going to be trouble. See, but we, we, all, we all think we got that limit to how much we can take. But that's why I thank and praise God because he will not put more on me than I can bear. He knows that limit. He knows if I, if I got to forgive my brother 100 times or 200 times or 300 times, he knows that limit. So how often should I forgive my brother? Jesus tells him, he says, I say, he, Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee unto seven times, but unto seven times seven. As many times as you need to. As many times as my brother sins against me, I should forgive him. Why? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Because God, time after time after time, even after I got saved, has forgiven me. So how often shall I forgive my brother as many times as he, as, he, as he needs it? Because I want my brother to be right with God. So I should, I should, I should want that. The Bible says, he has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? To love mercy. See, mercy is an attribute of God. And in, and in my, my striving, in my uh, uh, pursuit to be all that God is, I should love mercy. I should want to array myself with mercy. I should want to be clothed with mercy because I want mercy. I want mercy. And so because I want mercy that bad, I should be that quick to dish it out. See, it's, it's, it's easy for me to tell somebody, you know, you need to forgive them. Oh, but when the rubber hit the road. <laughs> when I've been wrong, I ain't so quick to remember what you told so-and-so. Remember what you told Deacon Scott? You told Deacon Scott to forgive him. But look, but look how you all whelped up, got wind in your jaws. You all whelped up, ready to fight, but you were so quick to tell somebody else. It, these things ought not be. 
I should be just as quick. You see, God, I got to practice what you preach. I should be just as quick to give that mercy out that I want in return. Because mercy rejoiceth against judgment, the scripture says. In verse 23, um, yeah, jump to verse 23. Jesus is given a par- he gives a parable to help Peter understand what he is saying. And in verse 23 it says, Therefore um, is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which take, uh, which take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him, which owed him 10,000 talents. And I, I did some research on that because I wanted to see how much it was in today's money. And I got a couple different figures. Uh, one was, was $3.4 billion, and another was, I think it was $10 million. Uh, I don't know if one of you, does, it, does any of the saints know the exact number? No, nah, nobody knows the number. I, I, I just seen, I thought it was, was unique, but, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, it was an impayable debt. That's the point. The point was he had owed his servant a debt that could not be paid. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. What, did I, what, did I, what, what was it that I could not pay for? I could not pay for the sin that I had committed. I could not. The wages of sin is death. So somebody has to take that payment. Those wages, somebody has to accept that because there was sin committed. And because there was sin committed, somebody has to receive that payment because the wages of sin is death. So what did God do? God robed himself in flesh and he received that payment. That payment that I could not pay, that ransom that I could not be redeemed, that I could not redeem myself, nor could I redeem my brother. God said, I'm going to pick that payment up for you. I'm going to take that payment for you. But not just because I want to just take the payment for you, because blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. If you want this payment, if you want this mercy, you're going to have to be merciful. You're going to have to extend it. You're going to have to extend it. In verse where am I? Did I ju- I'm steady. Verse 25. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. Verse 26. The servant therefore fell down and worshiped him, saying, Lord, have patience with, with me and I will pay thee all the debt. Now, this is obviously a debt that he could not be that he could not pay. But he's asking still, I want you to forgive me of the debt that I know that I cannot pay. We, we, knew that we, cannot, we, we know that we cannot pay for our own sins, yet we still want God to pick that up. We still want to be saved. I still want to get to heaven. Don't you want to get to heaven? Yeah. I still want the forgiveness even though I knew that I could not pay for it myself. That should even prompt me even yet the more, seeing that I couldn't do it myself, it should even prompt me that much more to be right. In verse 27, it says, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loose him and forgave the debt. I told you that God was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was moved with compassion and did something about it. The Lord of this servant was moved with compassion, seeing that his servant could not pay the debt. He can't pay the debt. So I'm going to, in other words, I'm going to pay the debt for him. I'm I'm, I'm going to do it for him because I see he can't pay it. In verse 28, he says, but that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which he owed a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and choked him. Now, this is absolutely crazy. Every time I read it, it's not funny, but every time I read it, I laugh because it's like, my goodness, you didn't ran and cho- you didn't choke the man over about $17. Now, you didn't, now you didn't owed everywhere up to t- 10 million or how many ever billion dollars, but you laid, it said he laid hold on him and he choked him. He laid hold on him and choked him, saying, pay me, uh, pay me that thou owest. When my brother came to me and he wants the forgiveness, when, when my brother's seeking the forgiveness f- from me, I should want to give that to him. When he's asking me, brother, please forgive me. I did you wrong. The servant came to him. He said, please uh, uh, f- give me time. I'll pay all the debt. I pay all the debt. W- when my brother or my sister or somebody is coming to me begging for that mercy, I did you wrong. I should give it to him because God gave it to me. In verse 29, and it says, And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all the debt. Um, verse 30, And he would not, but uh, went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, 
I forgave thee all the, that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest thou not also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? Again, it's the compassion. It's the compassion that I should have on somebody else because God has had it on me. In verse 34, he says, And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father uh, do also unto thee, if ye from the heart forgive not everyone his brother their trespass. So I have an obligation to forgive my brother their trespass. If they sin against me, I should want them to get the forgiveness. But it's not just with lip service. It's not just with an outward expression, but it has to be from the heart. I love that this is interjected here at the end. It's almost like he was going to skip this. Oh, I forgive you. Yeah, you know what? I forgive you. You don't owe me. You know how people do. Don't pay it. Yeah, you're forgiven. But, but you know your heart not right. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 know, you know they're not going to pay you So because you know they're not going to pay you you're just going to forgive the debt but you still, you still harboring the hate in your heart about it you, 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 you st- you're still mad about it but no we have an obligation to forgive from the heart and make sure that if I, if I want mercy if I'm going to be the merciful I must uh, to, I mean to obtain the mercy I must be merciful amen, amen. that's all I got for tonight amen